Welcome back to the Chats and Recaps podcast with your host, Sammy. And Mimi. We're glad you joined us today. So, so let's, let's get, get into, into it. it. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that notification bell so that you never miss an upload. These are true stories from the HBO docuseries, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. The following episode may contain graphic depictions of rape, violence, and sexual assault, which may not be suitable for all listeners. Listening discretion is advised. If you or anyone you know is a victim of rape, sexual assault, or abuse, please reach out to your local police department or a crisis hotline for support. Happy Wednesday. Welcome back to another podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Um, before we get into today's episode, we just first want to preface by saying that we are currently on our road to 1,000 subscribers. Yay. So make sure that you subscribe, share, like, hit the notification bell if you're on YouTube because we are on the road to 1,000 subscribers. And once we hit that first goal of the 1,000 subscribers, we will be doing a giveaway. So stay tuned. We will give you information on how you can be entered in the giveaway, and you can also find more information on our website as well, chatsandrecaps.com. And with that being said, really quickly, we're going to go ahead and get into today's episode. And this time, Mimi is going to be guiding us through the majority of this episode. Okay, so this is um, episode four and five of I'll Be Gone in the Dark with Michelle. Michelle McNamara. McNam McNa I can never say her last name right. McNamara. I'm sorry. May you rest <laughs> in peace. Um, so episode four is um called The Motherload, and it begins in with her thoughts and writing, which I would say would be like a memoir on um in Northern Ireland in nineteen ninety two, where she speaks of how her supervisor who at the time was married with kids, used his position and power to coerce her into extramarital sex. Um, I think it only happened once, if I'm not mistaken. And I guess that once was all it took because then she knew she had to go back home to the U.S. And then it shows, it goes on to Kira, her publisher, when she speaks a little bit about Michelle's book. Um how she got how Michelle got in the EAR or Iran's records and files at the County of Orange Sheriff's Department. Um, so she went through the files as she was going. I mean, she was doing like two things. She was writing a book and she was investigating. Um, she was trying to solve this murder to give peace to a lot of the victims because there was no justice brought. And these rapes were happening from the 70s all the way up to what, the 90s? like the early 90s yes. um she did on numerous occasions say how the book and the investigation was taking a toll on her as she stated the book is like a bottomless pit like a bottomless monster that was just taking over her mind her life her feelings um i can't even imagine being a mother a writer and then trying to solve that case and how it it consumed her but she was still doing it because she needed to find peace for these victims. Um, they, they, they then show her, her and Paul Haynes, um, where she's like, we need two SUVs. We're going to the County oh, yeah. of Orange Sheriff's Department and we're getting these boxes of files. Like, mind you, they were like hundreds of boxes all marked. So they took these two SUVs down to the County um, Sheriff's Office and um, they went in because first, let me just say she was very persuasive in getting what she wanted. I know um, no one, even certain detectives from other departments couldn't get to those records. And somehow she she spoke to the right person and she got she persuaded them and she got her hands on these files. So they filled up the SUVs with these boxes. And you would think. They were all of it, but they were just half. And she was going through all these boxes, all these files, all these pictures of the. Um, I forgot what you call that crime, scenes. the crime scenes. So when she got the collections of these boxes and she went through it, 
by going through all these boxes, she was able to pretty much put together what kind of person this was, who they were looking for. She was able to know that he was first based in, and I hope that I'm saying this right, Visalia, California. Um, they knew he was a white man. He wore a ski mask. He was a shoe size nine to nine and a half. Um, knew that he took things from the crime scenes like necklaces, uh, jewelry, men's underwears, men's underwear is like, really? Men underwears, pictures. He would tear the pictures. Women's underwear. He, um, he also took men underwear. She said he had a fixation on female underclothes. He, he would lay them out like the undergarments and the lingerie. He would lay them out all over, like oh, all over um, the house. And these in Vesalia, he was called the ransacker. Yes. He was at large in Vesalia between the years 1974 and 1976. Correct. And she noticed, like you're explaining, there were a lot of similarities in what he, in these crimes and what the Eron's killer did. Yeah, she was able to gather all this information and kind of put them together as this is the same person. This is how he started. He started by watching people l like a peeping Tom. Mm -hmm. um, one of the police officer, Mr. McGowan, he was called to one of the scenes where uh, they reported that a man was looking through a window and apparently he was, you know, either masturbating in front of the window or whatever he was doing, getting his fixation. And the officer at that time he shot in the air and told him don't move and the guy screamed don't don't shoot me and he was he said he was like baby faced um he gave a description after being hypnotized because he couldn't remember anything from what happened um so he was the only one who really got to see who the person was mm -hmm. um um what happened when he when after he was like immediately attempting to surrender, he only had one hand up during the surrender. McGowan went up to arrest him. And that's when his right hand behind his back, he pulled out a revolver and shot him. Oh, and yeah, I'm not sure right. if he shot him in the eye because when they showed the video, he had like a patch a covering patch. his right mm -hmm. eye. And uh, yeah, that was why he had to be hypnotized, probably because he experienced something traumatic. And then through the hypnotism, he was able to then describe him as he did right and they said that he struck 130 times yes, over in less than a three-year time period yes, he did. when he was doing this was all before of that. he moved into rape yeah this was before he became known as the Eron's killer correct um michelle then knew that his start was there oh. he was the visalia right. ransacker what happened was when she had suggested if they were connected, one of the cops said, well, the description of him from the 1974-75 does not match at all the mm -hmm. description of the man who was at large in the Sacramento area. However, one thing that I notated was that he had six months between when he was doing those crimes in Visalia to when he committed his crimes in Sacramento. Now... Six months is a good enough period of time for you to get in shape, for you to grow out hair, for mm -hmm. you to change your appearance. And the reason that he left Visalia was because a description was able to be released of him. So people now knew who to look out for, like what he looked like. So if he is this like smart serial killer, which it kind of seemed like he was, then he left immediately. And his first thought would be, man, I have to change how I look. So mm -hmm. six months is enough time to lose weight. And I noticed from the rendering of when he was committing those crimes in 75 to six months later when he committed his first crime in Sacramento, the original sketch, he had like a military grade cut. In the second sketch, his hair had grown out significantly. The um, first victims that he raped um, gave a police description saying that after the rape, he would sit in a corner and start crying and sobbing, saying saying um i hate you bonnie i hate you bonnie um which was something that he started saying but then i guess he stopped because then after that he just got into more tormenting where he would tell them i'll be gone in the dark before um before you know it or something like that 
I'll be yeah. I'll be gone in the it dark. It kind of matches his profile of how his uh how his crimes escalated mm-hmm. in Sacramento. Like remember he went from just going into the house and like making himself at home and mm-hmm. then he would just rape the woman and leave to he started getting more and more like how she said he liked to up the stakes. So he was like up yes. in he would up his ante. He went from a peeping tom to mm-hmm. actually breaking in and raping the women to breaking in whether they was a man there or not, mm-hmm. to then murdering Killing them. Yeah. So it was like he kept upping and upping and upping and upping every time. Well, he she also found that one of the victims, which um, later on was actually his first case that he killed, one of the victims. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. <clears throat> I don't know what's wrong with me today. It was... Um, well, first, let me just say that the publisher then went on to saying that um, they noticed that her writing started slowing down because she really got into the investigation. Then she kind of figured out, wait a minute, I can't do both because I really want to solve this case. Right. So her writing slowed down on the book and her investigation escalated. Um, she also started um, wondering if they have collections of DNA um, if they can use those collections of DNA to do like a genealogy search. Yeah, she did um, an family. She did an ancestry, ancestry. kit called mm-hmm. 23 and Me. And from her, she did that. Her and like her family did it. And then it got her really excited. She started like seeing all the people she was connected with in her family tree. And then she became fascinated with the idea of that DNA genealogy. And then she thought, hmm, well, maybe this can help us find like who this guy is because obviously he's related to people. So maybe if they can pull his DNA and search, they might find family tree, which might lead to figuring out yes. who this guy is, or at least who he's related to, which can help narrow it down to who they're yes. looking for. Um, also, one of the people that um, Michelle was in contact with uh, for this case did say that one of the suspects she used to date, she invited him down for dinner. She was thinking of stealing the silverware because oh, yeah. she wanted to try to get some kind of DNA from him to give it to the police department um, to see, you know, to try to see if he's the one or clear him. Um, but she she started thinking, man, I can't steal the silverware. He's going to be like, why are you taking the why are you taking the silverware? Right. So uh, she was like, hey, um, let me drive you home. She thought maybe if I drive him home, I'll try to get something. So he started sipping on a bottle of water and she noticed there was a little bit in there. So she's like, hey, can I get that last sip? And she took the bottle. She kept it. She turned it into the police department. But of course, his DNA didn't match. So correct. The search went on. Um, Now, during this time that she was doing all this investigation, Michelle was going through her own personal demons. Um, Many people contacted her, tried contacting her either by phone, text, message. She wouldn't respond for days. Um, The only person she would respond to would be her husband and her daughter. Um, Otherwise, like outside of her home, she was closed off. She ate. She... She lived, she ate, and she breathed this case. Um, then it goes on to one of the victims. Her name was Janelle. She was drugged and raped at the age of 15, which had nothing to do with the Golden State Killer. It was actually done by one of her friend's father. This is why I don't believe in sleepovers. Her uh, daughter went over to her best friend's house for a sleepover. and. Her best friend's father drugged and raped her. This was somewhere, what, in 86? Yes, this was uh, 1986. Yeah. Um, so then, no, I'm sorry, before 1986. Oh, yeah, 1986. So in 1986, when... her parents went to Mexico and they left her home. Uh, in 1986 was when she was killed by the Golden State Killer. Now, the first night home... She called one of her friends to stay with her because she was kind of scared. Of course, you know, being a rape victim from before, uh, she was scared to stay by herself. So her friend stood. <clears throat> they said there was a noise outside. They went and checked, um, but there was nothing. Then I think it was like the next day or so, he came back. I guess he was scoping out the house like he always does. Then he came back. That's when they found her dead in her room. He killed her with some kind of metal object or something he beat her to death 
um, he raped her and he beat her and he killed her. Um, so they talked a little bit about that and I mean, back to like, this is why I don't believe in sleepovers because nobody knows what's going on behind closed doors. You know, nobody knows what's going on in that person's home until you're actually living in that person's home. Um, you never know what kind of perverts live in those houses. Everybody might look picture perfect, but they're not. And that's why I'll never believe in sleepovers. Um, then she goes back to, well, they go back to her talking about her boss, who was her supervisor, and the night in Northern Ireland, um, how she then felt that it's like, did he rape me? Did he not rape me? Like, it was, it was a lot of stuff going on with her. Again, I, she was fighting her own demons. And then they go over to Bob and the Aaron's rape victims as um, she describes their, I think it, it was Bob and his wife. They were describing that his wife was, I, I can't believe I forgot to write her name down. His wife was one of the victims. He was, I think, the first one who was the couple that he raped the woman while the man was tied down and her husband, Bob, couldn't help her. So they were showing them their afterlife, how they moved on. Um, they looked through pictures. They eventually, you know, they were either we're going to let this destroy us or we're going to just move on and, and live life. So they opened up their own business. Then they had six kids and, you know, they moved on. Oh, they but had even, four kids. They were a family of six. Oh, yeah. Family of six. But even though um, even though they moved on. Still today, it still creeps up, you mm -hmm. know, it's, they still think about it. I mean, that she, was a trauma. She was diagnosed with PTSD. Yes. I believe they both suffer from PTSD from the situation. But they, they moved on. Um, again, they showed more texts and calls and messages to Michelle, like for her birthday. Um, but she doesn't respond to anyone. And then they show her like they're showing her receiving all these messages and then they show her pouring her glass of wine and having her Chinese takeout because she was so self-absorbed in investigating and going through those files that sometimes she would just get a hotel and stay there to do this. She also traveled talking to witnesses. Um, interviewing victims and talking to people and, you know, getting as much as she can looking for clues, um, just always on the road. And she was barely home. Um, in one of the case boxes, she found a lot of pictures of the crime scene, um, pictures of how he rummaged through the home and how he destroyed things in the home. She thought this wasn't just a rapist. It was something more. He was something more. And then um, Michelle was very distant with her husband as she kept being consumed with the case. She started requesting from her husband to get like pain meds from his mother so she can sleep. She would take Adderall during the day, fentanyl and other medications like Vicodin and all that at night so she can sleep. Um, sometimes she would go two, three days without sleeping. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I could. I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't imagine putting myself in her shoes because with her fighting her own personal demons and then looking at these pictures and looking at the misery and looking at all the stuff over and over and over and listening to tapes. And I can't imagine, of course, I would need something to sleep too. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's insane. I couldn't do it. No, me neither. I couldn't let those pictures take up space in my head i have a hard know. enough time watching the this docuseries let alone having really? that be your life 24 7 i could and it seemed like she was unable to take like vacations from it or she couldn't there was like one or two maybe she that didn't she know took, how to but stop. they were like so brief she didn't and know how to stop. she described how it was with her no matter what, no matter like when she walks up the stairs, when she does laundry, when she's spending time with her daughter. It's like always, always there in her head. She was consumed. 
um, in April, Michelle was then shown listening to the recorded calls and looking at the crime scene photos. She texts her husband asking for more Xanax as she had not slept in two days. She tells her husband that she's not feeling well. He tells her, I'm, I'm coming over. She's like, no, don't. Um, and please don't tell anyone that I'm sick or not feeling well. Her husband texts her back. Um, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry that you feel this way. She said, I'll be fine. I'm going to go take a bath. The text ends with a heart emoji and then continues to write on. She continues to write on. After she, was, after she wrote the letter to the old man, they then show a mug of coffee hot next to her bed. Mm-hmm. Her husband texts her, hey, Michelle, um, I put a hot mug of coffee for you to drink. Then he texts her, texts her again, hey, are you awake? When nothing, he went upstairs and then they show him, they, we hear him calling the ambulance. I guess that was a live recording from Mm -hmm. when he actually called for an ambulance. Yep. And And then that's how episode four ended. So then we go into episode five. It's called Monster Receives But Never Vanishes. Um, episode starts again with showing all the file boxes coming out of the county of Orange Sheriff's office. In this episode, it mostly focuses on Michelle's death, which was on 421 2016. They show Mary, Michelle's sister, as she described when Paton told Mary that Michelle was dead. She she was like, he was like, you know, she's she's dead. And she's like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, she's yeah. not dead. And he's like, yeah, she's dead. She's like, I'm not understanding this. I'm not comprehending what you mean by she's dead. Like yeah. she couldn't comprehend that her little sister was gone. She I was the can, baby. I can understand the feeling of somebody calling you and saying that someone is dead and they're talking in this like frantic tone that is almost like you hear them, but you mm-hmm. don't hear them. I know. Because I went through this. Yes. When I called um, my family. Mm -hmm. And then I got a call back later of somebody like frantically saying that someone in the family had passed. And I was like, did and didn't understand. So I understand like, I understand exactly what she was saying when she was discussing the phone conversation back and forth. Yeah, she just, she was like, I just couldn't understand that he was trying to tell me that my little sister was gone. Yeah. Because she was the baby of all of them. She was the last born. Um, He then started talking about how he said that when he put the hot mug of coffee next to her nightstand or on her nightstand, she was breathing. He said, I then went downstairs. I went through my emails, um, you know, doing stuff like he always does every morning. He uh, texts her, let her know that he left her coffee there. She doesn't respond. He goes through his emails again. He's like, wait a minute. She hasn't responded. He texts back. Hey, you awake? No response. He goes upstairs and that's when she's not breathing. So um, then they show all his sisters speak about her death. Um, They talked about when she was young, how full of life she was when she was young. Um, They still couldn't imagine and they still couldn't like comprehend that she was gone. Their little sister was gone. They especially when. There's no illnesses, no nothing. When, when someone is ill, you're like, okay, we were expecting this. We're, you're still not ready, but you know it's coming. But when someone dies suddenly like this, with no reason or rhyme, it really hits hard. Yeah, especially because at this time, they didn't have any closure because the autopsy and everything and her formal cause of death hadn't been disclosed to them yet so they were really just questioning how 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 is this possible yeah then they have um patan speaking about that day he speaks about how frightened he felt walking in the room um the weekend after that she died they had a pool party for alice which was michelle's little girl because they said that you know they had to show her they have a kid so they have to show them that, that it's still life goes on it's still more right. it's still normal i didn't even know like how to tell her or you know mm-hmm. so one of the sisters was talking about when they were putting alice to bed um they mentioned how every night when michelle would put her to bed she would always have 
this thing with her daughter where she would say, okay, what is your rose and what is your thorn of the day? And then her daughter would answer and then she would answer. Well, her aunt states that, well, her aunt stated that that night after the pool party, Alice told her that her rose was that everybody was there with her today. And her thorn of the day was that her mother was dead. I was sad. I was like, oh, I'm so sad. Yeah. That's heartbreaking because she's so young and losing a mother. nine years old. Yeah. It's, it's hard because she's starting to get into those ages where she needs her mom the most. So um, everyone was so devastated to hear of her passing. Um, then the file boxes were given to Paul Haynes, who was then still going through the cases, um, trying to figure out because he still wanted to carry on what she was doing. He didn't want it to die. Um, Patan knew he had to finish. So they all got together to finish her book. The publisher was on board with finishing the book. They got um, an author to finish writing it for her. They gave her all the notes. Paul Haynes was like her right hand man. He knew like everything that she was doing. He knew her yeah. passwords. He knew everything. So he got all of that information, gave it to the author. The author went through it and he was like, wow, this stuff is really good. Like he was kind of excited yeah. to finish her book. Um, he then came across the, the letter to the old man who, where he decided that was going to be the ending of the book. Um, then they showed the detectives talking about her passing and how they felt it was like losing a family member. They felt like she was a partner of the police force. Yeah. You know, she, they didn't think of her as a civilian. They thought of her as part of their team. Yep. Um, actually she was a lot smarter than some of them. No offense, but she was yeah. I mean, the way she thought her process. At the memorial, the detective spoke. Um, there was a lot of family members and a lot of people that was working on the case, helping her. She had a lot of people from all over working, yeah. even from different states, like people on. Um, what do they call those? Um, oh, my God, I forgot. What it's called. I don't know what you're trying to say. <sighs> when they're writing stuff. Message um, board? No. Well, there was the message board and why can't I think of what it's called? When you, a blog. When you write the blog. They were, there was like the special blog where they all was on it. And they were all passing those mm -hmm. back and forth in the forums and in the, the message boards. One of the detectives that was really working closely with her on this cold case. He felt like he had to continue working on this case because not working on it would be a dishonor to her because she put everything into this. And he knew she was close. She was close. She was so close to helping them figure out who this was. So he started listening to some of her recordings. And he noticed that in one of the recordings, she was talking about DNA and ancestry testing and genealogy. And he thought, wow, why couldn't we have thought about this? So he called all of the um, different departments that had collected evidence from the crime scenes in their area and asked if they had DNA testing, um, DNA of the serial rapists. And they said, we have tons. How much do you want? And he says, send them. So the what she was talking about was the ancestry kits mm -hmm. where you do a saliva swab, send it over, and then they can determine your ancestry tree. Yes. He wasn't able to do that because they didn't have saliva, but they did have other DNA. He left yes. the scene of the crime. And so he found something else that was very similar called GED, which uses a digital DNA profile instead of a saliva swab. Correct. And that is where he was able to put the DNA to create that digital DNA to then compare. And then from there, he was able to do the ancestry and build the family tree. Yeah, um, there is where he met with Barbara. I think that's what her name was. Let me just do a double check. Um, Close I think enough. it was Barbara. Let me see. 
Yeah. Her name was Barbara Ray Rentner. She was a genea genea oh, can't even speak. genealogist. Um, he got together with her and that's where they she took the DNA and they were doing like all kinds of testings with the DNA and they started to create this family tree, but they had to work from backwards forward because they didn't have much to go right. on. But the the DNA testings kind of pinpointed what who they were looking for. Um they knew he had blue eyes by the mm -hmm. by the testing um they knew that he, he, they knew that at the age of what 72 that he would have premature balding um so they knew like all these little traits i don't to think look you for. prematurely bald at 72 like i think like that's the expected age well i mean I, well that's what they said i don't know Oh, they were able to so, deduce that he would have had premature balding, right. meaning like when he was probably in his 40s, he was probably already balding or probably. 30s, something like that. Yeah. So it might, it's probably not important at this point because he's already, you know, like in his 70s. So you would expect him to have already been balding, but maybe it could ring bells for other people to put the profile out there that mm -hmm. they might have well, noticed certain things or whatever. Then they go back to a victim. Um, which at the time she was 15. I think she was the youngest one that he raped. Um, she talked about how she fell into depression, how her, fa her family didn't talk about what happened to her. So it made her feel like guilty of what, ha what had happened. Um, so that seemed to be she, a big theme in like the seventies. All the victims didn't never spoke out and unreported crimes seemed to be a big thing in the seventies and families just like pretending it never happened. Seriously. Uh, you know, it, is a shame to say, but it still happens today. There are families that just refuse to talk about things. It's like, okay, it's done. We're, we're just moving on. They Not don't know talking I, about something doesn't mean it didn't happen. I know. I don't know if they're doing that because they don't know how to handle it. It's okay to say, I don't know how to handle this, but we got to try to figure something out. We got to talk about it. We got to let people know what's going on out there. I, I mean, that's how I feel. Yeah. I couldn't keep something like that shut because there's no shame. You didn't do anything wrong. I feel like wrong. it makes the victim feel like they can't speak out because yeah. it's something shameful. Because it's like, well, it must have been something that I did then. No. And at 15, could you imagine how she felt? Yeah. I mean, an older person might see it differently. Like, it wasn't my fault. But at a 15, where their mind is still like, unrolling and developing especially back in the 70s i mean yeah really. um then they show her where they they talk a little bit where she says in 2018 she saw an article about one of the victims and then she thought wow another victim i wasn't the only one because at that time she thought she was the only one because they didn't talk about things they didn't talk she, so she thought she was the only one going through this well, it was the um, first time they had put like an actual victim's yes. face in the paper. Like there was a name to the yes. victim of the crime. So, so she's like, I'm not the only one. Yeah, she reached um, out. They reached, she reached out to her. They got together and then they said, you know what? We need to speak about this. We need to let everybody know. We need to let the victims know it's okay to come forward. It's okay to talk about this. One thing this was a little bit disturbing when she said, my parents were dead at that time. Had her parents been alive, she wouldn't have done this docuseries and she would have never reached out to that victim and she would have never spoke because she would have been afraid to bring it up knowing how her parents felt about it. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm sorry to make you feel uncomfortable about what happened to me. Like, that's ridiculous. Um, then they had... Michelle talking about her depression and the drugs, um, as she stated, pills made her feel good. She tried to be in a happy place in a try to keep happy. And like when her baby was born and her marriage and try to stay in that happy mode. But her depression crept in and would take over those happy modes. And it seemed like the only thing that made her feel good was these pills. She would take Adderall during the day to focus and then fentanyl or Vicodin, Vicodin 
or any other drugs during the night Xanax to sleep. Um, so it, those medications are correct. It says she was taking various kinds of opioids mm-hmm. that included fentanyl, Adderall, Xanax, and Vicodin, and various other opiates. They don't really mention what the other opiates are, but it indicated that there are synthetic medications that may have been laced with other things um, Mm -hmm. that were not prescribed medications. And so uh, one of her family members goes into what the actual autopsy that came back reported her cause of death was. The ultimate cause of death was effects of multiple drugs and other conditions contributing but not related to immediate cause of death was heart issue. So it's important to note the heart issue could not have been her cause of death is what they noted on the final autopsy. Um, She then talked a little bit about how she repaired her relationship with her mother. And just as everything was going good between her and her mother, she receives a call that her sister is telling her our mother is dead. So then that put her in a dark place again. Um, She then wished that, you know, she was kinder to her mother. So she was like tormenting herself with a lot of these things. Um, When she had her daughter, she then stated, you know, hey, mom, I got it. I I now understand you raised us. You were raising us by yourself. You had to put up with so much. Her father was an alcoholic. Her her mom was also battling depression um, and taking medications for it. She uh, then they show Patton describing how he had to tell his daughter that her mother was gone. So he he talked a little bit about that. Um, he talks about his grieving process. Um, how he had to move on. They show him on stage as a, because she's a comedian. So they show him on stage talking about his grief, um, trying to make it a little bit funny. To try to, you know, get over it, I guess. And then he's telling everyone that his wife just passed away. And then he makes it a funny by saying, you know, if one more person tells me that I wish you strength on this journey of grieving or healing healing on this journey of healing, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because how is there a journey to healing? Is there ever healing? I don't think there is. I don't think there's ever healing. There's just that you move on. I would say it's healing in the in the sense of when you have a really, really bad injury that's so bad that your skin never heals the same and you mm-hmm. always have that scar. Yeah. Like it'll heal, it'll cover up and you will be able to go on, but that scar will always be there. I mean, it won't bleed anymore. It won't, you know, but it's there. Yeah, everybody's different. It's there. So then they go back to Paul Haynes. Um, he was describing that at the time, nobody knew why she died. Um, then he read on Star Tabloid that the coroner then revealed the autopsy stating what killed her. And it was the, it was, how did they say, it stated that she died from multiple effects of drugs. I think she, fentanyl was one of the biggest ones at this time, because this yeah. was in 2016 when she passed. Um, yes. And at this time, they kind of show it briefly in the documentary, several other high profile yes. celebrities who also at the time like passed from fentanyl over overdoses associated with the drug fentanyl. Fentanyl is, I believe she said, 100 times stronger mm-hmm. than morphine. Yes. And at this time, a lot of medications and drugs that were being sold on the street were being laced with fentanyl. Yes. Mind you, lacing it with fentanyl is a deadly combination. And even she said like a small dose of fentanyl is enough to Just kill someone. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. So not knowing what she took. Um, the autopsy revealed there was Adderall, opium, fentanyl, and Xanax found in her system. She did have a heart condition, but that was not the cause of her death. Um, It was an accidental overdose of these medications. Mm -hmm. She did have a history of taking all these medications. Um, She took Adderall, of course, in the morning and Vicodin to sleep at night. Patton, her husband, he had no clue that, you know, she was taking all these combinations because she made it so nonchalant. She's like, yeah, I take a, 
you know, an Adderall in the morning to help me focus. And yeah, I take a Vicodin to go to sleep because sometimes there's days that she can't sleep. So he never, he didn't know at what extent she was, ta- how much she was taking these medications because a lot of times it was hidden from him. So, I mean, he didn't think anything wrong with taking an Adderall maybe here or there. He, he just didn't see any of the red flags. Um, she kept everything hidden pretty well. She really did. A lot of her friends and family said it. She kept a lot of things hidden so well. I think when they were going through her files, there's a lot of uh, portions. I'm not sure if that's her own voice, if it's somebody imitating her voice when they're reading her very personal diary entries talking about her struggles. I don't know if they it's showed not her pictures voice. of like diary entries yes. of her talking about like how she felt. And in the diary entries and everything that she's writing, it's very clear, obviously, that she's going through something very deep, that she's in a deep depression. Yes. Um, so I don't know. If, I guess these are things that they uncovered when they got access into all her folders and they started reading through. Because yeah. once you see that, it gives a lot of like background to what she was going through and what was going on in her head. Mm-hmm. And as a writer, she was probably just like writing out the thoughts and not really saying them to anybody correct. and writing them down may have been her like way to cope. That's correct. She did have like memoirs and diaries for herself. Yeah. She wrote out all her feelings. She was a writer. That's all she did. She just wrote everything out. And man, um, does she know how to, how to write oh my in a gosh. way that in a way that anybody can understand? I don't know. Her writing when she, when they're reading all her thoughts and everything, how she wrote it made you f- like every word made you feel it. It was like, I don't know. Her words were so deep that it just it's it hits you. It it strikes you. She was she was a talented writer. She was very talented. She knew how to use words. I I can see why she had people doing stuff for her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if that's how she wrote, even how her emails, even her emails. It's like, like she was writing going, a book in her yes. emails. It, I was like, I don't. I, wow, she. I wish I could write like that. Um, you know, and then her friends talking about how she was outgoing in school. She was popular. She was always happy. Um, she was like happy go lucky girl, you know, and they didn't know what was going on inside of her. Um, then they show the police public announcement about the Golden State Killer and how they announced a reward of 50000 If someone would come forward with any information about the killer, which was about time, because they never did anything like that for this person, for this animal, for for this beast. Because I can't even call him a human being. Yeah. They had this announcement offered uh, by the FBI was done on June 15th, Mm -hmm. 2016. This was two months after she had passed. passed. And they did say that the reason that this happened was directly attributed to the attention that she brought to the case. Yes. She brought a lot of things to light. A lot of things. So it got the ball rolling to find the killer. Um, Co-case investigators started working on getting matches for the DNA. um, And it's all because of Michelle's findings. Everything she was pulling out of these reports, things that other people weren't seeing, she was seeing, she was pulling out. She was a great writer. Of course, she's going to be pulling things out. Um, Things in the picture that she noticed were out of place, maybe, or things that, you know, patterns. So they started working on the ancestry. Um, They did the reverse tree building. And then they found nine men in the California area around the right age for him. Um, They found an uncle who worked in a construction. They spoke to that uncle's sister for DNA, but no match. So the nine men that they found, they were no match to the DNA. So Melanie, who was a friend of Michelle's, spoke about... She was raped, not by the Golden State Killer or the ear ear on or um, that beast, but she was raped and molested by a person, another person. And she Um, she was young. She never really dealt with that when she was young. She never told her parents what happened. And she started taking drugs and 
that's when she was stating how if she knew that Michelle was going through what she was going through, she probably could have helped her because she fought addiction and she fought a lot of demons and, you know, kind of came out into the light. So she was um, also talking about her depression, self-medicating herself. And, and then it moved on to, to everyone that was working on her book. They worked straight four to six months to complete her book and investigating the case. Correct. Um, Michelle's book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, hit number one in the bestseller list in 2018. They show Patton at the book signing, giving signatures in the book. Once the book published, Patton felt it was another form of saying goodbye to her. Because it's like, we did it. We did it for you. And now it's like, goodbye again. Um, they did tours, they did, um, like what they call that live speaking of the books, um, um, live readings, live readings. Then in one of the live readings or in one of the discussions, one of the audience stood up and asked Patan, how is he dealing with all of this and how his daughter is keeping, how how is he helping his daughter keep the memory alive? He then told him, I have a memoir of, of my wife from the time she was young until the time before she passed away so that her daughter will always know who she was and how she was. And that is there ready for whenever his daughter is ready to look at it. So I thought that was pretty cool that he did that. Um, He's like, he got pictures of her from when she was a little baby until right before yeah. she passed. Like her whole life like memoir. Like her whole life memoir, just waiting for Alice to be, when she's ready to just go in and know who her mother was. Yep. Um, then it goes back to the investigation. They uh, found a report of an arrest from a man who fit the description, who was shoplifting at 72, 72 year old shoplifting shoplifting the genealogist barbara um read the article and she was like hmm this guy really sounds close to the guy we're looking for she reaches out to the detective who then states she said hey do you have this guy as a suspect because he was actually living in those areas when this was happening the detective said no so he then went out and started doing more investigation on this person he got fascinated by this person and he's like you know i need to know more about this person he went out he pretty much stood in front of the the guy's house he um they then got like a piece of tissue out of the trash mm -hmm. or something and it had his dna in it and guess what it was a match 100 percent match 100 percent match and they had the guy he was a police officer, yep. which is why he had easy access in and out and why he scoped houses and how he got away with this, because nobody ever thought of a cop doing these rapes. So the uh, 72 year old ex-police officer, Joseph D'Angelo, is arrested. And he was arrested in what, 2019? Um, he's in jail now. And um, then they show Patton as they were asking him. He w I guess he was coming from a flight and he's rolling with his suitcase and the camera comes up and they're like, hey, Patton, how does it feel? They caught the killer. And he stated, um, well, I wish it was Michelle standing here in front of this camera telling you how she felt. and." Then he said he hopes that they get him. And um, then he said Michelle got him. So, and that's how that episode, excuse me. So. And that's how that episode ended. He was actually arrested in 2018. 2018? Yes. Okay. It says he had remained almost silent in court mm -hmm. since his 2018 arrest until he uttered the word guilty in a hushed and raspy voice multiple times in a plea agreement that will spare him the death penalty for a life sentence with no chance of parole. 
I mean, I'm just like, my goodness, this man, if we can't even um, call him that. They're going to show that in the last episode. Anyway. Well, they really didn't say what year he was arrested. Yeah, the, it just kind of ended just, with they had the because guy. Because the next episode is going to be all about Yeah, I'm assuming it'll be about and, the trial and yeah, all that. So, and the trial. So. I'm just like, this, I don't know what to call him. Monster. I don't either. Because I don't to feel believe, like he is think, worthy of the word man or person or human. To think he fathered this, a child. I know. This monster. A daughter. At 72 years old. Can you, like can you everything imagine? he did in his everything that he did in his life wasn't bad enough. He still had to keep, I guess, pushing his luck by shoplifting. Shoplifting. The monster has no conscience. No. None. He has none. No it's conscience just like whatsoever. Baffling. Baffling. I can I can't even imagine how his daughter must feel. Like how how was he able to father a child? Like seriously. Seriously. I don't know, but that was the end of episode five. Mm-hmm. Um, there is going to be one final episode, which will be the finale episode that wraps up the whole series. I'm assuming that episode six is going to be going over his arrest and I'm gonna talk and trial and all of that. So we'll watch that episode when it's available. I don't think it's available yet, Mm-mm. but it will be soon. So that will probably be wrapped up next week friday because i feel like it yes. should be aired by then yes and then we will wrap up the series on i'll be gone in the dark yep so thank you for listening we hope that you are staying safe and happy and healthy and that you manifest everything you desire out of life amen <laughs>